are y'all all bored? <laughs> all aboard. Or well, let's go ahead and let let's move on. Okay, so let's talk about. So today in lesson one of our Sunday school, we're going to talk about what is religion, the evolution of religion, evolutionary religion versus real religion, religion, and then why you need a personal religion. Okay, so what is religion? The definition. The original word of revolution, it, it, it came from the Roman word religio, and it is derived, that word is derived from religur, or religur. It's the same word that, um, that you may hear in, re in regards to, to um, when you say you are relegating or regulating or relegate, it means to go through again and again in your word or your thought. And that word first appeared in a private letter between two politicians in Rome when they were um, discussing the character of another politician. And they said that he had a, his behavior, he had a particular religion or religious, a religion that he guided his behavior by. And so the idea of the word religion came from that which a person does consistently over and over and over again, and that we, as people observing them, we don't know what it is. So it's basically the idea of your thought consistently being dictated, your thoughts, your actions, towards some inner vision or some higher reality that only you can see. But you are lining up your conduct you're lining up your actions, you're lining up your thoughts according to some inner reality, some inner vision that only you have. And by doing that over and over again, despite the contrary appearances, that's what the root of that word religion came from. And that's how I, that's the definition I come up with. So your religion is, is that sustaining consecutive thought of your inner vision or your higher desire reality contrary to uh, appearances. We're going to talk more about that in the next lesson next Sunday. But today we're going to talk about what is to, where institutional religion came from and the origin of that. Any questions about the term religion? All right, so if you see on Zoom, you're able to, um, you do have that option of raising your hand. Um, and it'll show me. All right, well, let's keep right on going. All right, so the origins of religion. The origins of religion. It starts with the worship instinct. Biolog biologically, all humans have an instinct to worship. It has actually been proven by science now. There is an instinct in the brain, instinct in our human nature that allows us to worship, have an urge or a capacity to seek higher reality, seek God consciousness, um, but it has been proven and it is found as a gene, as an instinct, we call it the worship instinct or the worship urge. Um, so you have that worship instinct or that worship urge, and then you have chance, which is good luck, bad luck. Then you have death, which was very uh, weird phenomena for our ancestors. And then you have death, seeking to survive after death, and you got the fear of ghosts. So what we're going to talk about today is how these five factors influence and set the ground for religion or institutional religion. All right, so let's begin. Let's talk about that biological urge to worship. Um, so that biological urge to worship, it comes across as the sense of shunning, fearing, honor, and eyes, all combined in one urge, okay? When you become fascinated with any type of fetish, whether it is your love interest, whether it is your crush, whether it is anything that you get a sense of awe or fear or honor or inexplicable um, uh, uh, obsession over, that is your worship urge or your worship instinct being activated and being cultivated and then in the pun. We all have it. Um, depending on, we, most of us have it in various levels. Some of us have a huge urge to worship 
and we find ourselves being obsessed with things very easily. Um, what I've noticed is that individuals with a high capacity for what I call their urge to worship, they become the most uh, obsessive lovers. They become the most passionate and loyal workers because there's something in them that is just made to honor and awe something that has a huge impact on them. All right, so our early, early ancestors, many millennia ago, they started uh, their urge to worship. It was born out of their fears and out of their illusions, obsessions, and perceptions. And does anyone take a guess which one of these lists on my PowerPoint became the first, first universal object of worship and awe? Uh, maybe the plants and the trees. Okay. Who else wants to say? Elements. Okay. Nope. And nope. <laughs> Who said the moon? Joy? All right. Oh, that was Victoria. All right. Nope. Not the moon. Stones? It was stones. Yeah. What made you say stones? Because that was the last thing left. <laughs> I don't stones? know. I was, I was just looking at the list and I was thinking like, because I had said, you know, religion to me is ne ne not necessarily a good thing. Like, I to religion, I, just, I thought stones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here, here it is. Let me explain to you why it was stones. I'm going to take you back. I want you to time travel back into the mindset of an early, early, early human. All right. Early humans, they live in their tribe. They live in their land. They do very little travel outside of their location. They wake up every day and they experience the same exact world. What do you think when you, when you put yourself in that early mindset, what would be the first most random occurrences in that day-to-day -day path that they walk on. It would be rocks and stones, okay? At first, you don't really notice the sun or the moon because it's every day. So the origin of religion, the origin of worship for all of us, even today, it comes of things that come out of the ordinary, things that appear to be unusual. The key word are things that become unusual to us. That's where we tend to put our obsession to worship and have the sense of awe, fear, or wonder at. And stones were the biggest obstacle in the early human mind of how did it appear there. So after a rainstorm, all of a sudden that same path that those natives or those are not the natives, but our early ancestors who walked that same path every day at the rainstorm, all of a sudden there's a rock that appears out of nowhere. This is very unusual, and it invokes a lot of sense of awe. Sometimes stones have beautiful designs on them. You can use them as weapons. After stones, there were heels. And so this actually goes in order. From stones, men begin to worship heels and mountains. and becomes obsessed with the mountains and hills. After the stones and hills, it became the plants and the trees. Every culture has begun to worship plants and trees and put spirits on them. We still carry that tradition by having what during the most popular holiday season? We have a Christmas tree put in our house, okay? Um, so we still carry on this uh, tradition of worshiping the plants and the trees. We still have, um, every religion has a holy hill, a holy mountain. From then we evolved into the elements, the wind, the fire, earth, and air. As man progressed throughout evolutionary, the moon became fascinating. Then the sun was the was was the sun became observed as having more power over the elements and over the trees. And then after man began to worship stones, hills. Sorry, I moved. Let me go back he began to realize that it's not the sun, it is individuals who are unusual. So man has worshiped stones, 
hills, plants and trees, the elements, the moon and sun, and then they started worshiping any unusual person, whether they were twins that were born, whether they were people with special powers, whether they were people that had seizures, whether they were people with special deformities or special abilities. But that urge to worship has found itself being projected upon everything that you can imagine in nature. Our human urge to worship will find something to be obsessive over. They call fetishes or, or um, obsessions. Again, the stones, the hills, the plants and trees, elements, moons, and unusual persons. All right, any questions or any insight to add to that worship urge and that level of going through the worship? All right. After we have the worship urge and we're talking about worshiping stones and hills and elements and people, you add to that chance, okay? So again, go back to thinking about our early ancestors, going back to thinking about those early humans. They were food hunters and the struggle was real, okay? The struggle was real. Today, our struggle is for a quality of life or standard of living. We're not actually struggling to survive. We're struggling for our standard of living. There's quality of life that we want. No one is really struggling to actually stay alive another day for food, for shelter. But our early ancestors, were, their struggle for existence was real. And one bad mistake, one error, one error could be highly, highly, highly detrimental. Okay? It could be very detrimental. And so, our early ancestors lived in a constant dread of doing something that could produce bad luck and then ruin your chances and ruin, ruining your survival. Early man had two dominating interests, right? Every day they were waking up fearing doing something wrong or hoping that something good would come out of doing nothing. They were obsessed with this idea of survival of making sure you don't do anything that's going to interfere or interpret or impede among your survival and you don't want to do anything that is going to ruin your chances of getting what you need and also you are hoping you're hoping that something good is just going to happen without your effort somehow you just some days you ever have one of those days you just want someone to just hand you a cup of coffee and a million dollars and say thanks for trying you did a good job yeah so we all are hoping to win something. You know, we all want something free. All right. So primitive man was also asking because of this chance, because of this fear of bad and good luck, always asking who is tormenting. When something went wrong, they asked, where is this coming from? Who is tormenting me? And out of that question of who is tormenting me, what's going wrong? religion was born because they began to personify bad luck and good luck. So when they did something on a good day, they began to make a, 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 a observation of what we did. When we hunted from the left and we hunted on this day, we had a huge, huge payoff. That is the more sacred day to work. That day is the day of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so, because of these observations of what brought good luck and what brought bad luck, they begin to realize we should not ever, ever hunt on this day or never hunt on that or never kill that animal. That animal is more sacred than other animals. And so you begin to develop a sense of uh, religion, a sense of conduct and a sense of respect for rules and regulations and taboos. All right, y'all all aboard? Y'all still follow me? Yes. All right, let's keep it moving. <laughs> All right, so you got that worship urge, you got the personification of good luck and bad luck, and then you have death. Now, for us, we understand that we're going to die. But for our early ancestors, they did not see, they never got to experience natural death. Earth is a very violent place. And when you don't have the conveniences that we live in today, natural death 
was very rare and unusual. Like they just didn't get to see people die from just natural causes. They saw death happen as something violent. So when people would just die out of natural causes, that was very, very freakish and weird to them. They didn't understand what was going on. And so they began to have this obsession over death, natural death. Um, and anything that caused a natural death was created a sense of fear and it created a sense of dread. And so what happened is our early ancestors began to associate natural death as some influence, something that was caused by some spiritual unseen influence. They never fathom that we were just naturally supposed to die. Now, that idea has creeped in into our modern philosophies, our modern religion, hence basic, the base of Christianity is this idea of the original sin and death. The whole story of Adam and Eve is this idea that they weren't supposed to die until they ate that fruit. So there still is this idea that we were supposed to live forever. Our human mind does not like this concept that in a physical temporal world, we actually are made to die. We will only, we will die. We are dust and we return to dust naturally and organically. So we put a lot of reasons of, well, why do we die? It must be because of some sin. It must be because of the fall of man. It must be because of some spiritual influence. Never realizing, no, we just die because that's what happens to physical material world. It ends. But for our early ancestors, this was very freakish and weird. When people would just die of natural causes, it haunted them. It scared them. They didn't understand what was happening. And that allowed early man to really, really begin to begin to correlate, well, what did they do? They must have done something wrong. There must be some unseen force that's causing the die. When you add the death with ghosts, let's talk about um, dreams. So there's also, there's this idea of ghosts. So just to do a recap, to make sure y'all are following me, we got the worship urge, we got good luck and bad luck, being afraid of doing something wrong. Then we got death happening and not knowing what's happening then you got people dreaming of people who have died so everybody is having dreams about the former chief everybody's having dreams about their ancestors and in those dreams as you all can attest when you dream about someone has died it's so real to you it's like oh my gosh it's like they were here and it led the early humans to believe well the dead must still be alive and they must still be alive somewhere and because they visited me in my dream, they must be interacting with a steel. And they became fascinated with the breath of life. So in a cold climate, remember when you were a child and it was cold outside and you would blow, you would blow your oxygen and you would see your oxygen? It was so fascinating, right? Who else has thought that was fascinating as a child just to see your breath, you know, uh, in cold weather? And so our ancient ancestors began to associate that breath as the spirit. And they saw anything that, that if, it, if you were in a body and it breathed, that means you were alive. And if that spirit left you and it did not have a body, that was a ghost or a spirit. And so ghosts or spirits were regarded as having superhuman abilities and superhuman capabilities. And they became feared. And not only they become feared, but anything that happened unusual in the tribe, Anything that happened that was extraordinary or that could not be explained was attributed to these ghosts and these spirits. Everything became attributed to ghosts. If someone just got sick and died, a ghost must have entered them. A ghost must have, have possessed them. If anything happened that was missing, it was all attributed to a ghost or a spirit. Now, Two things still survive to this day. When we sneeze, we say, bless you. That is the origin of the idea that your soul has not left your body because that our ancient ancestors associated your breath with your life and your spirit. So the reason today when you sneeze, the idea is that your, your soul was trying to get out of your body. That's what the ancients believe, but you caught it in time 
So we're saying, bless you, you know, like, great job. You got your soul back. And we also still have this term when people die, we say they give up the ghost. It's time to give up the ghost. So these still traditions still linger in our mind, our psyche, because we still associate that, um, we still use the language, how, how our early ancestors associated breath with the spirit and the soul. But how this all created religion was that when you have a world now that, that where ghosts and spirits exist that are causing all types of unseen things, how are we going to manage these ghosts and these souls? What do you think we create next to manage these ghosts and these spirits from all their doings in our daily lives? Let me hear y'all's feedback. A prayer or a ritual or something? Yeah, that's very good. Definitely prayers and rituals. Maybe some other entity that could combat the ghosts. Denisha, you're on it. You're definitely on it. Hell. Uh, huh? I'm not, I'm not sure, Adam. Okay. All right. Um, uh, offerings to the ghost. What did you say, Victoria? Uh, um, offerings to try to like please the ghost. Offerings. All um, y'all are right. <laughs> offerings, rituals. But as Phoenicia <laughs> said, but who is going to conduct those offerings and those rituals? Uh -huh. Priest. The priest and the shaman and the medicine men. Some other unusual super normal power, right? As Phoenicia said. So now we look at the unusual person who's, who's the smart person in the tribe who makes the first connection of science or laws and they realize through some mysterious, however they do it, because of their, 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 their intel, in, intellect, their wits, they now become the shaman, the medicine man, the priest. And they now say, hey, I know what happened in your house. Your ancestor is unhappy because you all did not leave out their favorite tree this Christmas season. You didn't put out a plate offering for them. As a result, you made them angry, and now you need to appease them. Well, they set out the plate based on this person's instructions, and things return normal in their house or in their tribe. And now that person is seen as the all-wise, all-knowing person, and they become the first priest. And now anytime things go wrong, they go to this person, and this person thinks, and they say, you know what? We should cut down that evil tree. That evil tree is the problem. And the village goes to cut down the tree. And then whatever happens, stuff starts growing again. And then they say, ah, this person was right. And it goes on and on and on and on. And you read these stories. How many of us have read the, um, the novel, uh, Things Fall Apart? The Nigerian novel, okay? Remember in that novel, when, when the, the elders came and said, ah, this is why we have a drought. That slave boy is evil. His ancestors are cursing us. They killed the slave boy. The drought didn't go away. So then they say, oh, here's the problem. You shouldn't have killed him because he had became attached to you like you were his daddy. And now we're cursed. So now we must banish you. So what happens is the, the, uh, that fear of death, ghost spirits, bad luck, it gives the birth to um, the need. First, we have to appease the ghost by any means necessary. We got to make sure that people are buried correctly. We got to make sure our ancestors are appeased. But as we said earlier, who can conduct these rituals? How do we know if these rituals are right? How do we know if it's working? And that gives birth to the church. And finally, the church is born. Institutional religion is created. It is the reaction of our ancestors trying to cope for our world of ghosts and spirits and the reality of the imaginary world of ghosts. It is universally believed and 
good luck is associated with good spirits. Bad luck is associated with bad spirits. And we need shaman, priest, medicine men. We need all these unusual persons of our society that know how to deal with these spirits and ghosts. They will keep us safe. They will keep us protected. And we will know how to do everything right. Now, what is the good and bad of that, y'all? Is there any good that comes from that? What good, what good comes from it? Ask that question again, Adam. What good comes from this development of this institutional church out of this, out of this dependence on the shaman priest and the medicine men to help us help us get through this world of ghosts and spirits and bad luck and good luck? I guess it maybe we would think that it created some unity, maybe. Um, <laughs> is there any good? First, let me ask this question. Who thinks there is some good? All right. What is the bad that comes from it? You put some, you, in, you, you um, create some. <laughs> I could see the good as being like, you know, you have like systemized levels of understanding. So everyone's kind of on the same page, but then the bad being like, okay, well then the power battles and you have some cat who's like, well, just using it for their own sake. Leslie, you, you are absolutely right. The good is that it now unifies our society. It unifies the tribe. It unifies our code of conduct. We now can instill a sense of ethics. We now can instill a sense of moral behavior. We now can bring more leadership. We can now bring more unity through fear. The bad thing is that these shaman, these priests, and these medicine men, they can tell us absolutely anything they want to tell us, right? And who can question them, right? And we don't really have any evidence that we can go to contrary. And when we do have evidence to go to contrary, if another alternative shaman, priest, or medicine man comes up, he, now there's a power struggle, and someone is going to be the correct way, and someone's going to be deemed the demonic, evil shaman, the black magic versus the white magic. That's how that evolves. Because anything that is contrary to the accepted norm is the black magic. Anything that goes along with it is the so-called white magic. So, um, but yes, it does bring about a sense of unification. And basically what happens is the power, the good thing is this right here, the power of the tribe for the first time, for the first time after so many millennial, is handed over from the strong and the brave to the keen, the shrewd, the wise man and the intellectual. The, the big, strong man who was the leader, the best hunter, the one with the most uh, physical abilities, he was once the leader of the tribe. But now, because this ghost fear and these fear of spirits and this fear of bad luck is so prominent, we now finally hand over our influence, hand over our leadership to the wise person. And this is a huge and drastic step in our evolutionary process. Because the person with the most muscle and the most courageous and the most, the most courage and most strength, they may not be the smartest. They may not even be thinking about literally how to organize and how to lead. The person with the intellect may be despised or taken for granted. But now, that person with the intellect, that person who can outsmart the rest of the tribe, they are now become the leader. And now society is, that our tribe, our society is finally now being set up with a foundation to become an advanced society where we can begin to develop the arts, the poetry, the writing, the math, a language. All of this now can begin to be fostered because we now have ultimate respect for those individuals who are the wisest, the sharpest, and the smartest. Now, they may be playing us. Matter of fact, they are playing us every single day, but the fact that they can play us means they're very smart and they're very sharp. And now, they're able to direct. Those leaders can direct 
all of our, all of our, our um, they can direct us along the lines of being influenced by our higher thoughts and a conduct that is different than just going amongst our biological urges, instincts, and impulses. For example, early, early caveman, he did not question his anger. He did not question his sex uh, impulse. Whoever he wanted to mate with, if he was attracted, he made it with them. If he felt he wanted to kill somebody out of rage, he killed somebody out of rage. Okay? They didn't have any rote co code of, mo I mean, they didn't have any code of conduct of human ethics. But now, through the formation of rituals, of out of fear of doing something wrong, we now begin to have our impulses directed by a higher thought, by a conscious of what is right, what is wrong. And now we have this idea that there is a super material world, there's a world outside of ourselves that we need to align ourselves with. And this is going to drastically, drastically pave the way for society, for us to advance and for us to begin to receive true, true spiritual revelation and true understanding from those true spiritual powers, the angels, the gods, the extraterrestrials. They can't even begin to communicate to us if we don't even have an understanding that there is a higher power, okay? Are y'all all aboard? Does that all make sense to everybody? All right. So what is the review? Let's see. All right, let me see if y'all are all there. Now, I want us to um, talk about, before we wrap up, who feels like they understand the flow and the format of our evolution of religion? And who is lost? Be honest with me. So Adam, this is L. I don't feel lost, um, but I'm not certainly clear, but I do have a much better understanding than when I came into this. Okay, all right. Um, and I think what I was feeling when I say the negative impact that I've had on religion, this really helps me understand how that is possible. Elaborate, if you don't mind. Uh, well, you know, because being involved in different denominations of the church, and having church hurt, just kind of relating it to that they're just humans and they're people. You know what I'm saying? And so I think I've removed myself because of me find, uh, following a leader who's supposed to know what they're supposed to be preaching and teaching their congregation, not remembering that they're human and they may not know everything about what they're teaching, you know? so. Yeah. I've had a lot of church hurt and I, you know, just coming to the realization that, ah, oh, is it really that simple that they're human and they're people? You know what I'm saying? Really kind of as an aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. All right. So yes, yeah, so I have a lot of learning to do, but this does clarify some things for me. I'm not saying I'm 100% clear, but yeah. I have a much better understanding. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, who else? Uh, who else is, uh, thank you for sharing, Elle. Anything that anybody got any questions or any confusion about that evolutionary process? I had a bad signal, so I can drop out. I didn't catch everything. Okay. Who would like to give a quick summary of the evolutionary origin of our religious understanding for joy? This will give me a good feedback. And what is grass? I'm going to ask Leslie. Leslie, can you give a good summary? Um, <clears throat> it happened. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so, okay, so it started off like, where did you lose? <laughs> um, okay, so like, we have a natural instinct to be in awe and inspired and, you know, very curious and fascinated with things. We initially became 
fascinated out of stones, kind of born out of a fear. And then it went through a transgression, like or went, went through um, a progressive progression from the stones to hills, plants and trees, elements, moon, sun, and then to the Anuwa's jewel. Um, and everything that like out of the ordinary is what he says, like things became unusual, which I thought was a pretty interesting aspect. But then from there, once we went beyond like just being curious about, you know, the stones and the elements, it was like, okay, well, now I'm like, wow, this is fun. But now we start being like, okay, there's chance, there's good and bad luck. Certain days, you know, uh, you know, we might find water or, oh man, we shouldn't kill that buffalo. And then so we started being like, okay, well, when we, we notice patterns <laughs> and then we start kind of like creating some rules and regulations and some systems as to like, okay, maybe don't do that on such and such date. And then out of that, it kind of went over um, to, okay, on my notes. Um, we started wondering about death. Um, we were curious about, uh, some of it was inexplainable. We didn't just realize that people just died. And so, um, started a, another fear. What I'm getting out of all of this so far is that fear was ruling all. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Fear is the underlining motive. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, we're, we're curious about it. We think it's due to spiritual influence. So then we're like, okay, well, if there's spirits, well, and wait a second, these cats are showing up in my dreams. Are you dreaming about such and such? They must still be here. We can't see them. They must be existing somewhere else. So now we're like fearful of that. And then everything that we're curious about now goes to the, you know, this curiosity around the breath of life and the spiritual realm and everything that we're, we're not even sure of. So then it was like, all right, what we need, like, okay, so unusual persons, you know, you guys can be the middleman. Y'all can talk to the other side. You're weird enough for that. <laughs> So now you guys got to be the cats to like, let us know, like tap in, let us know what we're supposed to do. And then from there is kind of like where the religion, they, we gave them power. It went just from like reverence to now like, okay, well that's man who knows. So I'm going to do whatever they say. And now we're all, you know, connected and like, okay, you know, wear blue on such and such a day or you know, <laughs> don't kill the buffalo. But now you got the cats who are up in the power who are like, yeah, don't wear blue on such and such a day. <laughs> so. Very good. That was, that was, that was excellent. That was excellent. Lady. That was excellent. That was very good. And yes, so now we have an institutional religion. We got people in power and they're keeping that power so they say don't wear white after labor day but some people can't afford only white clothes you know and now they're being banned from the tribe because all they had to wear was white but the rest of the people are like don't be wearing that white up in my house you know and now it's like you were white in my house and ever since you wore that white in my house we have not been able to have a peaceful night's sleep you know and now we need to hang you and kill you and so it is a horrible process, but the good that comes of it is we are now unified and our minds are now directed towards a higher reality. And we're going to end on this note, preparing for next week. That higher reality begins to introduce to us the next form of religion, which is revealed religion. And I'm going to summarize it really quickly. We'll talk more about it next week. But revealed religion is religion that is not born out of our evolutionary instinct. Revealed religion is where these extraterrestrials, I don't know who they are, the gods, the, the Atlantis, the people from Lemuria, the channel beings, they come to earth and they basically say, we're going to tell y'all what y'all did not know. We're going to introduce to you all real science, real nature, real spiritual. And so what happened is periodically there has been revelations of truth, of real truth, of real spiritual insight that has come on our planet. Whether it is from the Atlantis civilization, whether it is from the Melchizedek, whether it's from a person like a Christ, whether it's from a person like a Buddha, but there's these people, there's these beings that come along every few years and they give us this profound truth that's never entered into our evolutionary ideas but they cannot even begin to speak to us, to share with us, unless we have first some idea of a need for a higher power. If we don't have that primitive religion in place, 
they don't they can't even show up to begin to talk to us because they show up we're just going to be like huh what but after we have already gone through the process and see there's a need, there's a higher power, there's a higher reality, it sets the atmosphere, it sets the tone in our mind, in our psyche, in our psychology, in our tradition for that understanding to come through. And that is called revealed religion. So we have two religions happening on the planet. We have evolutionary religion and then we have revealed religion. Evolutionary religion is going up from our instinctual nature and reveal religion is coming down actually from some enlightening extraterrestrial cosmic forces. And they come. Now, when they come and communicate to us higher truths, how do they communicate those higher truths? Do they actually share those higher truths as they are, or do they share them in the context of what we already know? Someone answer that. Uh, is it your intuition? What did, what did you say, Victoria? Um, yeah, if, if I was listening to the question, right? Um, was it your intuition? Well, it's, it's not just intuition, but they use our symbols and they use what we had already got from our institutional religion. So they just come in and they use what we already have, all right? One of the first, um, the first revelations that was given to the early Native Americans from some teacher that came down and told them, it told them about the great breath, the great spirit, the great one spirit, the great one breath of all life. But you see how that teacher, whoever it was that came and taught them, he only could use what they already have an understanding for. Because we cannot fathom things unless we already have a pre-existing understanding of. If you go back 300 years ago, you will have the hardest time illustrating to somebody what a computer is or what an iPhone is. Because you, they don't even understand, you can't say digital, you can't say picture, you can't say still images, you can't be like, it's like a TV screen, what's a TV screen? Well, it's words, or what are words? What's digital words? Like, you can't even begin to, to use. So you can imagine going back to 14,000 years ago and trying to communicate to people high spiritual truth and laws of the universe and laws of matter and mind. You can only use what they already have working. And that is how religion becomes mixed with half evolutionary and half revealed. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday school class. All right. So I'll email you all this PowerPoint to your emails that you registered. Um, any questions, anything for clarity, any other feedback anybody wants to give before we dismiss? I have a, I have a question, Adam. Yes. Um, so who are some, some, give us, I mean, not necessarily some homework, but I'm interested in um, knowing some, some like uh, events in time or some people that maybe I can look up in Google um, until we meet next week. Regarding people? Regarding the, um, the revealed aspect of religion. Okay, sure. I'm going I'm to bring up a slide right now that I think I have. Oh, no. Uh, uh. All right. Um, you have the Atlantis revelations. Okay. Um, you have uh, one of the most mysterious people in history is Melchizedek. Melchizedek. He's mentioned in the Bible very briefly, but he's mentioned in the Bible as the priest of Abraham. But uh, he was known as a big religious teacher who did not have a mother or father. He just appeared on the earth. Okay. And he is the one founder of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, but we will, but I would definitely, um, there every, there's, 
there. You Google Melchizedek, Google the civilization of Atlantis. Edgar Casey, he talks a lot about these different revelations and different understandings and different teachings that come about being. All right. Adam, who's the last person you mentioned? I'm sorry. Edgar Casey. He's a psychic, but he gives a big understanding and breakdown about the Atlantis mysteries and their religion. Um, one more thing, Adam. Is there anyone that's in like the 18th or 19th or like the 20th century, like the last 200 years we could look at? The Book of Urantia is oh, where okay. I got a lot of this information from. They okay. were, the Book of Urantia appeared in 1934 and no one knows where it came from. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. It's 2000, a 2,000 page book appeared out of nowhere. So they say it's called the Book of Urantia. Awesome. All right. Um, really quickly, I will go through uh, really quickly. Uh, if you have to leave, leave. I said I was going to leave at 11 o'clock, but I want to go really quickly over the main religions that are mixed with evolutionary and, um, and uh, revealed religion. All right, so all of the mixed, all the religions, as someone said, have fear with them. So you have the evolutionary fear mixed with revealed religion equals our modern religion. And all of the modern religions are hoping to give you some sense of salvation. And salvation just basically means deliverance from bad luck, deliverance from misfortune, or unhappiness, hell, purgatory, just something that, again, that you feel unfavorable. And they all teach some worship, how to worship, what's the right way to worship, what's the right things to do to make yourself happy or saved. Um, Buddhism is a religion that promises salvation from suffering. And it's a guide to, it gives you a guide to unending peace. Um, Judaism, the Jewish religion, hold on, it's going too fast. Sorry. The Jewish religion, it promises salvation from difficulties, and it gives you a guide to prosperity through righteous living according to the Ten Commandments. So the, the law of Moses, Moses, he promised the Jews what? If they obeyed his commandments, they would prosper and be safe from difficulties. It's not that hard to do, just obey those Ten Commandments, he said. But the moment you break those Ten Commandments, you're in trouble. All right, the Greeks, they had a religion that didn't have a lot of moral conduct to it. The Greeks' religion was more so just this idea of, of being fragmented, like having your mind. Excuse this slide, y'all. These slides are going really fast. But their thing was this idea of beauty. Like the Greeks had this fascination with being beautiful, beauty, the realization of beauty. Christianity came along. And Christianity said, well, forget the law of Moses, those Ten Commandments. Just have faith in Jesus and rededicate your life. Islam came about and Islam said, um, look, Islam said Christianity is hard. Judaism is hard. We're going to make it real easy for you. And Islam and Muhammad, they sought to make a very easy religion. They basically, Islam has basically said, look, Judaism is so hard. No one can live up to those standards. I don't know why my slide keeps moving. Um, 